Act One of Phaedra by John Racine, translated by Robert Bruce Boswell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae, narrated by Lambda. Theseus, read by Bruce Peary. Phaedra, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Hippolytus, read by Libby Gone. Aricia, read by Charlotte Duckett. Ononi, read by Amanda Friday. Theramines, read by Alan Mapstone. Ismene, read by Michaela. Panope, read by Marion Carwin. Scene 1. Hippolytus. Theramenes. My mind is settled, dear Theramenes, and I can stay no more in lovely Trozen. In doubt that racks my soul with mortal anguish, I grow ashamed of such long idleness. Six months and more my father has been gone, and what may have befallen one so dear I know not, nor what corner of the earth hides him. And where, prince, will you look for him? Already, to content your just alarm, have I not crossed the seas on either side of Corinth? Asked if aught were known of Theseus, where Acheron is lost among the shades, visited Elis, doubled Tanarus, and sailed into the sea that saw the fall of Icarus. Inspired with what new hope, under what favoured skies think you to trace his footsteps? Who knows if the king your father wishes the secret of his absence known? Perchance, while we are trembling for his life, the hero calmly plots some fresh intrigue, and only waits till the deluded fair— Cease, dear Theramenes. Respect the name of Theseus. Youthful errors have been left behind, and no unworthy obstacle detains him. Phaedra has long fixed a heart inconstant once, nor need she fear a rival. In seeking him I shall but do my duty, and leave a place I dare no longer see. Indeed. When, prince— did you begin to dread these peaceful haunts so dear to happy childhood where i have seen you oft prefer to stay rather than meet the tumult and the pomp of athens and the court what danger shun you or shall i say what grief that happy time is gone and all is changed since to these shores the god sent phaedra i perceive the cause of your distress it is the queen whose sight offends you. With a stepdame's spite, she schemed your exile as soon as she set eyes on you. But if her hatred is not wholly vanished, it has at least taken a milder aspect. Besides, what danger can a dying woman, one who too longs for death, bring on your head? Can Phaedra, sickening of a dire disease of which she will not speak, weary of life and of herself, form any plots against you? It is not her vain enmity, I fear. Another foe alarms Hippolytus. I fly, it must be owned, from young Aresia, the sole survivor of an impious race. What? You become her persecutor, too? The gentle sister of the cruel sons of Pallas shared not in their perfidy. Why should you hate such charming innocence? I should not need to fly if it were hatred. May I, then, learn the meaning of your flight? Is this the proud Hippolytus I see, than whom there breathe no fiercer foe to love, and to that yoke which Theseus has so oft endured? And can it be that Venus, scorned so long, will justify your sire at last? Has she, then, setting you with other mortals force e'en hippolytus to offer incense before her can you love friend ask me not you who have known my heart from infancy and all its feelings of disdainful pride spare me the shame of disavowing all that i professed born of an amazon that wildness you wonder at i sucked with mother's milk when come to riper age reason approved what nature had implanted sincerely bound to me by zealous service you told me then the story of my sire 
and know how oft attentive to your voice i kindled when i heard his noble acts as you described him bringing consolation to mortals for the absence of alcides the highways cleared of monsters and of robbers procustes circion scyro sinus slain the epidarian giant's bones dispersed crete reeking with the blood of minotaur but when you told me of less glorious deeds troth plighted here and there and everywhere young helen stolen from her home at sparta and Perebea's tears in salamis and many another trusting heart deceived whose very names have scaped his memory forsaken ariadne on the rocks complaining last this phaedra bound to him by better ties you know with what regret i heard and urged you to cut short the tale happy had i been to erase from my remembrance that unworthy part of such a splendid record i in turn am i too made the slave of love and brought to stoop so low the more contemptible that no renown is mine as such exalts the name of theseus no monsters quelled have given me a right to share his weakness and if my pride of heart must needs be humbled aresia should have been the last to tame it was i beside myself to have forgotten eternal barriers of separation between us by my father's stern command her brethren's blood must ne'er be reinforced by sons of hers he dreads a single shoot from stock so guilty and would fain with her bury their name that even to the tomb content to be his ward for her no touch of hymen may be lit shall i espouse her rights against my sire rashly provoke his wrath and launch upon a mad career the gods dear prince if once your hour is come care little for the reasons that should guide us wishing to shut your eyes theseus unseals them his hatred stirring a rebellious flame within you lends his enemy new charms and after all why should a guiltless passion alarm you dare you not assay its sweetness but follow rather a fastidious scruple fear you to stray where hercules has wandered what heart so stout that venus has not vanquished where would you be yourself so long her foe had your own mother constant in her scorn of love ne'er glowed with tenderness for theseus what boots it to affect a pride you feel not confess it all is changed for some time past you have been seldom seen with wild delight urging the rapid car along the strand or skilful in the art that neptune taught making the unbroken steed obey the bit less often have the woods returned our shouts a secret burden on your spirit's cast has dimmed your eye how can i doubt you love vainly would you conceal the fatal wound has not the fair Arisia touched your heart theramenes i go to find my father will you not see the queen before you start my prince that is my purpose you can tell her yes i will see her duty bids me to do it but what new ill vexes her dear ononi scene two hippolytus ononi theramenes alas my lord what grief was e'er like mine the queen has almost touched the gates of death vainly close watch i keep by day and night e'en in my arms a secret malady slays her and all her senses are disordered weary yet restless from her couch she rises pants for the outer air but bids me see that no one on her misery intrudes she comes enough she shall not be disturbed nor confronted with a face she hates scene three phaedra anoni we have gone far enough stay dear ononi strength fails me and i needs must rest a while oh, my eyes are dazzled with this glaring light so long unseen my trembling knees refuse support oh me would heaven that our tears might bring relief oh how these cumbrous gods these veils oppress me what officious hand has tied these knots and gathered o'er my brow these clustering coils how all conspires to add to my distress what is one moment wished the next is irksome did you not just now sick of inaction 
bid us deck you out, and with your former energy recalled, desire to go abroad, and see the light of day once more. You see it, and would fain be hidden from the sunshine that you sought. Thou glorious author of a hapless race, whose daughter twas my mother's boast to be, who well mayst blush to see me in such plight, for the last time I come to look on thee, O oh, son. What? Still are you in love with death? Shall I ne'er see you, reconciled to life, forego these cruel accents of despair? Would I were seated in the forest's shade! When may I follow with delighted eye through glorious dust flying in full career? A chariot! Madam? Have I lost my senses? What said I? And where am I? Whither stray vain wishes? Oh, the gods have made me mad! I blush, Ononi, and confusion covers my face, for I have let you see too clearly the shame of grief that in my own despite o'erflows these eyes of mine. If you must blush, blush at a silence that inflames your woes, resisting all my care, deaf to my voice, will you have no compassion on yourself, but let your life be ended in mid-course? What evil spell has drained its fountain dry? Thrice have the shades of night obscured the heavens, since sleep has entered through your eyes, and thrice the dawn has chased the darkness thence, since food passed your wan lips, and you are faint and languid. To what dread purpose is your heart inclined? How dare you make attempts upon your life, and so offend the gods who gave it you, prove false to Theseus and your marriage vows, ay, and betray your most unhappy children, bending their necks yourself beneath the yoke. That day, be sure, which robs them of their mother, will give high hopes back to the stranger's son, to that proud enemy of you and yours, to whom an Amazon gave birth, I mean Hippolytus. Ye gods! Ah, this reproach moves you. Unhappy woman! To what name gave your mouth utterance? Your wrath is just. Tis well that that ill-omened name can rouse such rage. Then live. Let love and duty urge their claims. Live. Suffer not this son of Scythia, crushing your children neath his odious sway, to rule the noble offspring of the gods, the purest blood of Greece. Make no delay. Each moment threatens death. Quickly restore your shattered strength, while yet the torch of life holds out, and can be fanned into a flame. Too long have I endured its guilt and shame. Why? What remorse gnaws at your heart? What crime can have disturbed you thus? Your hands are not polluted with the blood of innocence. Thanks be to heaven, my hands are free from stain. Would that my soul were innocent as they. What awful project have you then conceived, whereat your conscience should be still alarmed? Have I not said enough? Spare me the rest. I die to save myself a full confession. Die, then, and keep a silence so inhuman, but seek some other hand to close your eyes. Though but a spark of life remains within you, my soul shall go before you to the shades. A thousand roads are always open thither. Pained at your want of confidence, I'll choose the shortest. Cruel one, when has my faith deceived you? Think how in my arms you lay new-born. For you, my country, and my children I have forsaken. Do you thus repay my faithful service? What do you expect from words so bitter? Were I to break silence, horror would freeze your blood. What can you say to horrify me more than to behold you die before my eyes? When you shall know my crime, my death will follow none the less, but with the added stain of guilt. Dear madam, by all the tears that I have shed for you, by these weak knees I clasp, relieve my mind from torturing doubt. It is your wish. Then rise. I hear you. Speak. Oh, heavens! How shall I begin? Dismiss vain fears. You wound me with distrust. Oh, fatal animosity of Venus! Into what wild distractions did she cast my mother? Be they blotted from remembrance and for all time to come buried in silence. My sister Ariadne, by what love were you betrayed to death on lonely shores forsaken? Madam, what deep-seated pain prompts these reproaches against all your kin? 
It is the will of Venus. And I perish, last, most unhappy of a family where all were wretched. Do you love? I feel all its mad fever. Ah! For whom? Here now. The crowning horror. Yes, I love— My lips tremble to say his name. Whom? Know you him, son of the Amazon, whom I've oppressed so long. Hippolytus! Great gods! Tis you have named him. All my blood within my veins seems frozen. O oh, despair! O oh, cursed race! Ill-omened journey! Land of misery! Why did we ever reach thy dangerous shores? My wound is not so recent. Scarcely had I been bound to Theseus by the marriage yoke, and happiness and peace seemed well secured, when Athens showed me my proud enemy. I looked, alternately turned pale and blushed to see him, and my soul grew all distraught. A mist obscured my vision, and my voice faltered, my blood ran cold, then burned like fire. Venus I felt in all my fevered frame, whose fury had so many of my race pursued. With fervent vows I sought to shun her torments, built and decked for her a shrine. And there, mid countless victims, did I seek the reason I had lost. But all for naught! No remedy could cure the wounds of love. In vain I offered incense on her altars. When I invoked her name, my heart adored Hippolytus, before me constantly. And when I made her altars smoke with victims, t'was for a god whose name I dared not utter. I fled his presence everywhere, but found him, oh, crowning horror, in his father's features. Against myself at last I raised revolt and stirred my courage up to persecute the enemy I loved. To banish him I wore a stepdame's harsh and jealous carriage. With ceaseless cries I clamoured for his exile, till I had torn him from his father's arms. I breathed once more, Ononi. In his absence my days flowed on less troubled than before, and innocent. Submissive to my husband I hid my grief and of our fatal marriage cherished the fruits. Vain caution! Cruel fate! Brought hither by my spouse himself, I saw again the enemy whom I had banished, and the old wound too quickly bled afresh. No longer is it love hid in my heart, but Venus in her might seizing her prey. I have conceived just terror for my crime. I hate my life, and hold my love in horror. Dying I wish to keep my fame unsullied, and bury in the grave a guilty passion. But I have been unable to withstand tears and entreaties. I have told you all. Content, if only, as my end draws near, you do not vex me with unjust reproaches, nor with vain effort seek to snatch from death the last faint lingering sparks of vital breath. Scene 4 Phaedra, Anoni, Panop Fain would I hide from you tidings so sad, but tis my duty, madam, to reveal them. The hand of death has seized your peerless husband, and you are last to hear of this disaster. What say you, Panope? The queen, deceived by vain trust in heaven, begs safe return for Theseus while Hippolytus his son learns of his death from vessels that are now in port. Ye gods! Divided counsels sway the choice of Athens. Some would have the prince your child for master. Others, disregarding the laws, dare to support the stranger's son. Tis even said that a presumptuous faction would crown Aresia and the house of Pallas. I deemed it right to warn you of this danger. Hippolytus already is prepared to start, and should he show himself at Athens, tis to be feared the fickle crowd will all follow his lead. Enough. 
the queen who hears you by no means will neglect this timely warning scene five phaedra anone dear lady i had almost ceased to urge the wish that you should live thinking to follow my mistress to the tomb from which my voice had failed to turn you but this new misfortune alters the aspect of affairs and prompts fresh measures madam theseus is no more you must supply his place he leaves a son a slave if you should die but if you live a king on whom has he to lean but you no hand but yours will dry his tears then live for him or else the tears of innocence will move the gods his ancestors to wrath against his mother live your guilt is gone no blame attaches to your passion now the king's decease has freed you from the bonds that made the crime and horror of your love hippolytus no longer need be dreaded him you may see henceforth without reproach it may be that convinced of your aversion he means to head the rebels undeceive him soften his callous heart and bend his pride king of this fertile land in trozen here his portion lies but as he knows the laws give to your son the ramparts that minerva built and protects a common enemy threatens you both unite them to oppose aresia to your counsel i consent yes i will live if life can be restored if my affection for a son has power to rouse my sinking heart at such a dangerous hour end of act 1 Act Two of Phaedra by John Asin, translated by Robert Bruce Boswell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One. Arikia, Esmene. Hippolytus requests to see me here. Hippolytus, desire to bid farewell. Is true, Ismene. Are you not deceived? This is the first result of Theseus's death. Prepare yourself to see from every side hearts turned towards you that were kept away by Theseus. Mistress of her lot at last, Aresia soon shall find all Greece follow to do her homage. Tis not then, Ismene, an idle tale. Am I no more a slave? Have I no enemies? The gods oppose your peace no longer and the soul of theseus is with your brothers does the voice of fame tell how he died rumours incredible are spread some say that seizing a new bride the faithless husband by the waves was swallowed others affirm and this report prevails that with perithous to the world below he went and saw the shores of dark cocytus showing himself alive to the pale ghosts but that he could not leave those gloomy realms which whoso enters there abides for ever Shall I believe that ere this destined hour a mortal may descend into the gulf of Hades? What attraction could o'ercome its terrors? He is dead, and you alone doubt it. The men of Athens mourn his loss. Trozen already hails Hippolytus as king, and Phaedra, fearing for her son, asks counsel of the friends who share her trouble here in this palace. Will Hippolytus, thank you, prove kinder than his sire? Make light my chains and pity my misfortunes. Yes, I think so, madam. Ah, you know him not, or you would never deem so hard a heart can pity, feel, or me alone accept from the contempt in which he holds our sex. Has he not long avoided every spot where we resort? I know what tales are told of proud Hippolytus, but I have seen him near you, and have watched with curious eye how one esteemed so cold would bear himself. Little did his behaviour correspond with what I'd looked for. In his face confusion appeared at your first glance. He could not turn his languid eyes away, but gazed on you. Love is a word that may offend his pride. But what the tongue disowns, looks can betray. How eagerly my heart hears what you say. Though it may be delusion, dear Ismene. Did it seem possible to you, who know me, that I, sad sport of a relentless fate, fed upon bitter tears by day and night, could ever taste the maddening drought of love. The last frail offspring of a royal race, children of earth, 
I only have survived war's fury, cut off in the flower of youth. Mown by the sword, six brothers I have lost, the hope of an illustrious house, whose blood earth drank with sorrow, near akin to his, whom she herself produced. Since then you know, how through all Greece, no heart has been allowed to sigh for me, lest by a sister's flame the brother's ashes be perchance rekindled. You know, besides, with what disdain I viewed my conqueror's suspicions and precautions, and how, opposed as I have been to love, I often thanked the king's injustice, which happily confirmed my inclination. But then I never beheld his son, not that attracted merely by the eye. I love him for his beauty and his grace, endowments which he owes to nature's bounty, charms which he seems to know not or to scorn. I love and prize him riches more rare, the virtues of his sire without his faults. I love, as I must own, that generous pride which ne'er has stopped beneath the amorous yoke. Phaedra reaps little glory from a lover so lavish of his sighs. I am too proud to share devotion with a thousand others, or enter where the door is wide open. But to make one who ne'er has stooped before bend his proud neck, to pierce a heart of stone, to bind a captive whom his chains astonish, who vainly against a pleasing yoke rebels, that piques my ardour, and I long for that. T'was easier to disarm the god of strength than this Hippolytus, for Hercules yielded so often to the eyes of beauty as to make triumph cheap. But, dear Ismene, I take too little heed of opposition beyond my power to quell, and you may hear me, humbled by sore defeat, upbraided by pride, I now admire. What, can he love? And I have happiness to bend. He comes, yourself shall hear him. Scene 2 Hippolytus, Arikia, Ismene Lady, ere I go my duty bids me to tell you of your change of fortune. My worst fears are realized. My sire is dead. Yes, his protracted absence was caused as I foreboded. Death alone ending his toils could keep him from the world concealed so long. The gods at last have doomed Alcides' friend, companion, and successor. I think your hatred, tender to his virtues, can hear such terms of praise without resentment, knowing them due. One hope have I that soothes my sorrow. I can free you from restraint. Lo, I revoke the laws whose rigour moved my pity. You are at your own disposal, both heart and hand, here in my heritage, in Trozen, where my grandsire Pythias reigned of yore, and I am now acknowledged king. I leave you free, free as myself, and more. Your kindness is too great, tis overwhelming. Such generosity that pays disgrace with honour lends more force than you can think to those harsh laws from which you would release me. Athens, uncertain how to fill the throne of Theseus, speaks of you, anon of me, and then of Phaedra's son. Of me, my lord. I know myself excluded by strict law. Greece turns to my reproach a foreign mother. But if my brother were my only rival, my rights prevail o'er his clearly enough to make me careless of the law's caprice. My forwardness is checked by juster claims. To you I yield my place or rather own that it is yours by right, and yours the sceptre, as handed down from earth's great son Erechtheus. Adoption placed it in the hands of Aegeus. Athens, by him protected and increased, welcomed a king so generous as my sire, and left your hapless brothers in oblivion. Now she invites you back within her walls. Protracted strife has cost her groans enough, her fields are glutted with your kinsman's blood, fattening the furrows out of which it sprung at first. I rule this Trozen, while the son of Phaedra has in Crete a rich domain. Athens is yours. I will do all I can to join for you the votes divided now between us. Stand at all I hear, my lord. I fear, I almost fear a dream deceives me. Am I indeed awake? Can I believe such generosities? What God puts it into your heart? Well is the fame deserved that you enjoy. That fame falls short of truth. Would you for me prove traitor to yourself? 
Was it not boon enough never to hate me, so long I have abstained from harbouring this enmity? To hate you? I to hate you? However darkly my fierce pride was painted, do you suppose a monster gave me birth? What savage temper, what envenomed hatred would not be mollified at sight of you? Could I resist the soul-bewitching charm? Why, what is this, sir? I have said too much not to say more. Prudence in vain resists the violence of passion. I have broken silence at last, and I must tell you now the secret that my heart can hold no longer. You see before you an unhappy instance of hasty pride, a prince who claims compassion, I, who so long the enemy of love, mocked at his fetters and despised his captives, who, pitying poor mortals that were shipwrecked in seeming safety, viewed the shores from land, now find myself to the same fate exposed, tossed to and fro upon a sea of troubles. My boldness has been vanquished in a moment, and humbled is the pride wherein I boasted. For nearly six months past, ashamed, despairing, bearing where'er I go the shaft that rends my heart, I struggle vainly to be free from you and from myself. I shun you present. Absent I find you near. I see your form in the dark forest depths. The shades of night, nor less broad daylight, bring back to my view the charms that I avoid. All things conspire to make Hippolytus your slave. For fruit of all my bootless sighs I fail to find my former self. My bow and javelins please me no more. My chariot is forgotten with all the sea-god's lessons, and the woods echo my groans instead of joyous shouts urging my fiery steeds. <sighs> Hearing this tale of passion so uncouth, you blush perchance at your own handiwork. With what wild words I offer you my heart, strange captive held by silken jess, but dearer in your eyes should be the offering, that this language comes strange to my lips. Reject not vows expressed so ill, which but for you had ne'er been formed. Scene 3 Hippolytus, Arikia, Theramenes, Ismene Prince, the Queen comes. I herald her approach. Tis you she seeks. Me? What her thought may be, I know not, but I speak on her behalf. She would converse with you ere you go hence. What shall I say to her? Can she expect— You cannot, noble prince, refuse to hear her. Howe'er convinced she is your enemy, some shades of pity in her tears is due. Shall we part thus? And will you let me go, not knowing if my boldness has offended the goddess I adore? Whether this heart left in your hands— Go, prince, pursue the schemes your generous soul dictates. Make Athens own my sceptre. All the gifts you offer me I will accept, but this high throne of empire is not one of the most precious in my sights. Scene 4 Hippolytus, Theramenus Friend is all ready, but the queen approaches. Go, see the vessel in fit trim to sail. Haste! Bid the crew aboard, and hoist the signal, then soon return, and so deliver me from interview most irksome. Scene 5 Phaedra, Hippolytus, Anoni There I see him. My blood forgets to flow, my tongue to speak what I am come to say. Think of your son, how all his hopes depend on you. I hear you leave us, and in haste. I come to add my tears to your distress, and for a son plead my alarm. No more has he a father, and at no distant day my son must witness my death. Already do a thousand foes threaten his youth. You only can defend him. But in my secret heart remorse awakes, and fear lest I have shut your ears against his cries. I tremble lest your righteous anger visit on him ere long the hatred earned by me, his mother. No such base resentment, madam, is mine. I could not blame you, prince, if you should hate me. I have injured you. So much you know, but could not read my heart. To incur your enmity has been mine aim. The selfsame borders could not hold us both. In public and in private I declared myself your foe. 
and found no peace till seas parted us from each other. I forbade your very name to be pronounced before me. And yet, if punishment should be proportioned to the offence, if only hatred draws your hatred, never woman merited more pity, less deserved your enmity. A mother jealous of her children's rights seldom forgives the offspring of a wife who reigned before her. Harassing suspicions are common sequels of a second marriage. Of me would any other have been jealous, no less than you, perhaps more violent. Ah, oh, Prince, how heaven has from the general law made me exempt, be that same heaven my witness. Far different is the trouble that devours me. This is no time for self-reproaches, madam. It may be that your husband still beholds the light, and heaven may grant him safe return in answer to our prayers. His guardian god is Neptune, ne'er by him invoked in vain. He who has seen the mansions of the dead returns not thence. Since to those gloomy shores Theseus is gone, tis vain to hope that heaven may send him back. Prince, there is no release from Acheron's greedy maw. And yet, methinks, he lives and breathes in you. I see him still before me, and to him I seem to speak. My heart! Oh, I am mad! Do what I will, I cannot hide my passion. Yes, I see the strange effects of love. Theseus, though dead, seems present to your eyes, for in your soul there burns a constant flame. Oh, yes, for Theseus I languish and I long. Not as the shades have seen him, of a thousand different forms the fickle lover, and of Pluto's bride the would-be ravisher, but faithful, proud e'en to a slight disdain, with youthful charms attracting every heart, as gods are painted, or like yourself. He had your mien, your eyes, spoke and could blush like you, when to the isle of Crete my childhood's home he crossed the wave, worthy to win the love of Minos' daughters. What were you doing then? Why did he gather the flower of Greece and leave Hippolytus? Oh, why were you too young to have embarked on board the ship that brought thy sire to Crete? At your hands would the monster then have perished, despite the windings of his vast retreat. To guide your doubtful steps within the maze, my sister would have armed you with the clue. But no, therein would Phaedra have forestalled her. Love would have first inspired me with the thought, and I it would have been whose timely aid had taught you all the labyrinth's crooked ways. What anxious care a life so dear had cost me! No thread had satisfied your lover's fears. I would myself have wished to lead the way, and share the peril you were bound to face. Phaedra, with you, would have explored the maze, with you emerged in safety, or have perished. Gods, what is this I hear? Have you forgotten that Theseus is my father and your husband? Why should you fancy I have lost remembrance thereof, and am regardless of mine honour? Forgive me, madam. With a blush I own that I misconstrued words of innocence. For very shame I cannot bear your sight longer. I go. Oh, cruel prince! Too well you understood me. I have said enough to save you from mistake. I love. But think not that at the moment when I love you most I do not feel my guilt. No weak compliance has fed the poison that infects my brain. The ill-starred object of celestial vengeance, I am not so detestable to you as to myself. The gods will bear me witness, who have within my veins kindled this fire. The gods, who take a barbarous delight in leading a poor mortal's heart astray. Do you yourself recall to mind the past? T'was not enough for me to fly. I chased you out of the country wishing to appear inhuman, odious. To resist you better, I sought to make you hate me. All in vain. 
hating me more, I loved you none the less. New charms were lent to you by your misfortunes. I have been drowned in tears and scorched by fire. Your own eyes might convince you of the truth, if for one moment you could look at me. What is't I say? Think you this vile confession that I have made is what I meant to utter? Not daring to betray a son for whom I trembled, t'was to beg you not to hate him I came. A weak purpose of a heart too full of love for you to speak of aught besides. Take your revenge, punish my odious passion, prove yourself worthy of your valiant sire, and rid the world of an offensive monster. Does Theseus's widow dare to love his son? The frightful monster, let her not escape you. Here is my heart, this is the place to strike. Already prompt to expiate its guilt, I feel it leap impatiently to meet your arm. Strike home! Or if it would disgrace you to steep your hand in such polluted blood, if that were punishment too mild to slake your hatred, lend me then your sword, if not your arm. Quick! Gift! What, madam, will you do? Just gods! But someone comes. Go, fly from shame. You cannot scape if seen by any thus. Scene 6. Hippolytus, Theramenus. Is that the form of Phaedra that I see hurried away? What mean these signs of sorrow? Where is your sword? Why are you pale, confused? Friend, let us fly. I am indeed confounded with horror and astonishment extreme. Phaedra! But no. Gods, let this dreadful secret remain forever buried in oblivion. The ship is ready if you wish to sail. But Athens has already given her vote. Their leaders have consulted all her tribes. Your brother is elected. Phaedra wins. Phaedra! A herald, charged with a commission from Athens, has arrived to place the reins of power in her hands. Her son is king. Ye gods who do know her, do you thus reward her virtue? A faint rumour meanwhile whispers that Theseus is not dead, but in Epirus has shown himself. But after all my search, I know too well. Let nothing be neglected. This rumour must be traced back to its source. If it be found unworthy of belief, let us set sail, and cost whate'er it may, to hands deserving trust the sceptre's sway. End of Act Two Act Three of Phaedra by John Asin Translated by Robert Bruce Boswell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. Phaedra, Anone. Ah, oh, let them take elsewhere the worthless honours they bring me. Why so urgent I should see them? What flattering balm can soothe my wounded heart? Far rather hide me. I have said too much. My madness has burst forth like streams in flood, and I have uttered what should ne'er have reached his ear. Oh, God, how he heard me! How reluctant to catch my meaning, dull and cold as marble, and eager only for a quick retreat! How oft his blushes made my shame the deeper! Why did you turn me from the death I sought? Oh, when his sword was pointed to my bosom, did he grow pale or try to snatch it from me? That I had touched it was enough for him to render it for ever horrible, leaving defilement on the hand that holds it. Thus brooding on your bitter disappointment, you only fan a fire that must be stifled. Would it not be more worthy of the blood of Minos to find peace in nobler cares, and, in defiance of a wretch who flies from what he hates, reign, mount the proffered throne? I reign! Shall I the rod of empire sway when reason reigns no longer o'er myself? When I have lost control of all my senses? When neath a shameful yoke I scarce can breathe? When I am dying? Fly! I cannot leave him! 
dare you not fly from him you dared to banish the time for that is past he knows my frenzy i have o'erstepped the bounds of modesty and blazoned forth my shame before his eyes hope stole into my heart against my will did you not rally my declining powers was it not you yourself recalled my soul when fluttering on my lips and with your counsel lent me fresh life and told me i might love him blame me or blame me not for your misfortunes of what was i incapable to save you but if your indignation e'er was roused by insult can you pardon his contempt how cruelly his eyes severely fixed surveyed you almost prostrate at his feet how hateful then appeared his savage pride why did not phaedra see him then as i beheld him this proud mood that you resent may yield to time the rudeness of the forests where he was bred inured to rigorous laws clings to him still love is a word he ne'er has heard before it may be his surprise stunned him and too much vehemence was shown in all i said remember that his mother was a barbarian scythian though she was she learned to love he has for all the sex hatred intense then in his heart no rival shall ever reign your counsel comes too late ononi serve my madness not my reason his heart is inaccessible to love let us attack him where he has more feeling the charms of sovereignty appeared to touch him he could not hide that he was drawn to athens his vessel's prows were thither turned already all sail was set to scud before the breeze go you on my behalf to his ambition appeal and let the prospect of the crown dazzle his eyes the sacred diadem shall deck his brow no higher honour mine than there to bind it his shall be the power i cannot keep and he shall teach my son how to rule men it may be he will deign to be to him a father son and mother he shall control try every means to move him your words will find more favour than can mine urge him with groans and tears show phaedra dying nor blush to use the voice of supplication in you is my last hope i'll sanction all you say and on the issue hangs my fate scene two phaedra alone venus implacable who seest me shamed and sore confounded have i not enough been humbled how can cruelty be stretched farther thy shafts have all gone home and thou hast triumphed wouldst thou win a new renown attack an enemy more contumacious hippolytus neglects thee braves thy wrath nor ever at thine altars bowed the knee thy name offends his proud disdainful ears our interests are alike avenge thyself force him to love but what is this ononi returned already oh, he detests me then and will not hear you scene three phaedra anoni madam you must stifle a fruitless love recall your former virtue the king who was thought dead will soon appear before your eyes theseus has just arrived theseus is here the people flocked to see him with eager haste i went by your command to find the prince when with a thousand shouts the air was rent my husband is alive that is enough ononi i have owned a passion that dishonours him he lives i ask to know no more what i foretold it but you refused to hear your tears prevailed over my just remorse dying this morn i had deserved compassion your advice i took and die dishonoured die just heavens what have i done to-day my husband comes with him his son and i shall see the witness of my adulterous flame watch with what face i greet his father while my heart is big with sighs he scorned 
and tears that could not move him moisten mine eyes. Think you that his respect for Theseus will induce him to conceal my madness, nor disgrace his sire and king? Will he be able to keep back the horror he has for me? His silence would be in vain. I know my treason, and I lack the boldness of those abandoned women who can taste tranquillity in crime, and show a forehead all unabashed. I recognize my madness, recall it all. These vaulted roofs, methinks, these walls can speak. And ready to accuse me, wait but my husband's presence to reveal my perfidy. Death only can remove this weight of horror. Is it such misfortune to cease to live? Death causes no alarm to misery. I only fear the name that I shall leave behind me. For my sons, how sad a heritage! The blood of Jove might justly swell the pride that boasts descent from heaven. But heavy weighs a mother's guilt upon her offspring. Yes, I dread the scorn that will be cast on them, with too much truth, for my disgrace. I tremble when I think that crushed beneath that curse they'll never dare to raise their eyes. Doubt not, I pity both. Never was fear more just than yours. Why, then, expose them to this ignominy? Why will you accuse yourself? You thus destroy the only hope that's left. It will be said that Phaedra, conscious of her perfidy, fled from her husband's sight. Hippolytus will be rejoiced that, dying, you should lend his charge support. What can I answer him? He'll find it easy to confute my tale. And I shall hear him with an air of triumph to every open ear repeat your shame. Sooner than that may fire from heaven consume me. Deceive me not. Say, do you love him still? How look you now on this contemptuous prince? As on a monster frightful to mine eyes. Why yield him then an easy victory? You fear him. Venture to accuse him first, as guilty of the charge which he may bring this day against you. Who can say tis false? All tells against him. In your hands his sword happily left behind. Your present trouble, your past distress, your warnings to his father, his exile which your earnest prayers obtained. What? Would you have me slander innocence? My zeal has need of naught from you but silence. Like you I tremble, and am loath to do it. More willingly I'd face a thousand deaths. But since without this bitter remedy I lose you, and to me your life outweighs all else, I'll speak. Theseus, however enraged, will do no worse than banish him again. A father, when he punishes, remains a father, and his ire is satisfied with a light sentence. But if guiltless blood should flow, is not your honor of more moment, a treasure far too precious to be risked? You must submit, whatever it dictates. For, when our reputation is at stake, all must be sacrificed, conscience itself. But someone comes, tis Theseus, and I see Hippolytus, my ruin plainly written in his stern eyes. Do what you will, I trust my fate to you. I cannot help myself. Scene 4 Theseus, Hippolytus, Phaedra, Anoni, Theramenus. Fortune no longer fights against my wishes, madam, and to your arms restores— Stay, Theseus. Do not profane endearments that were once so sweet, but which I am unworthy now to taste. You have been wronged. Fortune has proved spiteful, nor in your absence spared your wife. I am unfit to meet your fond caress. How I may bear my shame, my only care henceforth. Scene 5 This is Hippolytus Theramenus Strange welcome for your father, this. What does it mean, my son? Phaedra alone can solve this mystery. But if my wish can move you, let me never see her more. Suffer Hippolytus to disappear forever from the home that holds your wife. You, my son, leave me? Twas not I who sought her. Twas you who led her footsteps to these shores. At your departure you thought meet, my lord, to trust Aresia and the queen to this Trozinian land and I myself was charged with their protection. 
but what cares henceforth need keep me here my youth of idleness has shown its skill enough for paltry foes that range the woods may i not quit a life of such inglorious ease and dip my spear in nobler blood ere you had reached my age more than one tyrant monster more than one had felt the weight of your stout arm already successful in attacking insolence you had removed all dangers that infested our coasts to east and west the traveller feared outrage no longer hearing your deeds already hercules relied on you and rested from his toils while i unknown son of so brave a sire am far behind even my mother's footsteps let my courage have scope to act and if some monster yet escaped you let me lay the glorious spoils down at your feet or let the memory of death face nobly keep my name alive and prove to all the world that i was your son why what is this what terror has possessed my family to make them fly before me if i return to find myself so feared so little welcome why did heaven release me from prison my sole friend misled by passion was bent on robbing of his wife the tyrant who ruled epirus with regret i lent the lover aid but fate had made us blind myself as well as him the tyrant seized me defenceless and unarmed perithous i saw with tears cast forth to be devoured by savage beasts that lapped the blood of men myself in gloomy caverns he enclosed deep in the bowels of the earth and nigh to pluto's realms six months i lay ere heaven had pity and i scaped the watchful eyes that guarded me then did i purge the world of a foul foe and he himself has fed his monsters but when with expectant joy to all that is most precious i draw near of what the gods have left me when my soul looks for full satisfaction in a sight so dear my only welcome is a shudder embrace rejected and a hasty flight inspiring as i clearly do such terror would i were still a prisoner in epirus phaedra complains that i have suffered outrage who has betrayed me speak why was i not avenged has greece to whom mine arm so oft brought useful aid sheltered the criminal you make no answer is my son mine own dear son confederate with mine enemies i'll enter this suspense is overwhelming i'll learn at once the culprit and the crime and phaedra must explain her troubled state scene six hippolytus theramenus what do these words portend which seem to freeze my very blood will phaedra in her frenzy accuse herself and seal her own destruction what will the king say gods what fatal poison has love spread over all his house myself full of a fire his hatred disapproves how changed he finds me from the son he knew with dark forebodings in my mind alarmed but innocence has surely naught to fear come let us go and in some other place consider how i may best move my sire to tenderness and tell him of a flame vexed but not vanquished by a father's blame End of Act 3act four of phaedra by john racine translated by robert bruce boswell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org scene one theseus anone ah <sighs> what is this i hear presumptuous traitor and would he have disgraced his father's honour with what relentless footsteps fate pursues me whither i go i know not nor where know i am o oh, kind affection ill repaid audacious scheme abominable thought to reach the object of his foul desire the wretch disdained not to use violence i know this sword that served him in his fury the sword i gave him for a nobler use could not the sacred ties of blood restrain him and phaedra was she loath to have him punished 
she held her tongue was that to spare the culprit nay but to spare a most unhappy father o'erwhelmed with shame that her eyes should have kindled so infamous a flame and prompted him to crime so heinous phaedra would have died i saw her raise her arm and ran to save her to me alone you owe it that she lives and in my pity both for her and you have i against my will interpreted her tears the traitor he might well turn pale twas fear that made him tremble when he saw me i was astonished that he showed no pleasure his frigid greeting chilled my tenderness but was this guilty passion that devours him declared already ere i banished him from athens sire remember how the queen urged you illicit love caused all her hatred and then this fire broke out again at trozen sire i have told you all too long the queen has been allowed to bear her grief alone let me now leave you and attend to her scene two theseus hippolytus ah there he is great gods that noble mien might well deceive an eye less fond than mine why should the sacred stamp of virtue gleam upon the forehead of an impious wretch ought not the blackness of a traitor's heart to show itself by sure and certain signs my father may i ask what fatal cloud has troubled your majestic countenance dare you not trust this secret to your son traitor how dare you show yourself before me monster whom heaven's bolts have spared too long survivor of that robber crew whereof i cleansed the earth after your brutal lust scorned even to respect my marriage-bed you venture you my hated foe to come into my presence here where all is full of your foul infamy instead of seeking some unknown land that never heard my name fly traitor fly stay not to tempt the wrath that i can scarce restrain nor brave my hatred disgrace enough have i incurred for ever in being father of so vile a son without your death staining indelibly the glorious record of my noble deeds fly and unless you wish quick punishment to add you to the criminals cut off by me take heed this sun that lights us now ne'er sees you more set foot upon this soil i tell you once again fly haste return not rid all my realms of your atrocious presence to thee to thee great neptune i appeal if erst i cleared thy shores of foul assassins recall thy promise to reward those efforts crowned with success by granting my first prayer confined for long in close captivity i have not yet called on thy powerful aid sparing to use the valued privilege till at mine utmost need the time is come i ask thee now avenge our wretched father i leave this traitor to thy wrath in blood quench his outrageous fires and by thy fury theseus will estimate thy favour towards him phaedra accuses me of lawless passion this crowning horror all my soul confounds such unexpected blows falling at once o'erwhelm me choke my utterance strike me dumb traitor you reckoned that in timid silence phaedra would bury your brutality you should not have abandoned in your flight the sword that in her hands helps to condemn you or rather to complete your perfidy you should have robbed her both of speech and life justly indignant at a lie so black i might be pardoned if i told the truth but it concerns your honour to conceal it approve the reverence that shuts my mouth and without wishing to increase your woes examine closely what my life has been great crimes are never single they are linked to former faults he who has once transgressed may violate at last all that men hold most sacred vice like virtue has degrees of progress innocence was never seen to sink at once into the lowest depths of guilt no virtuous man can in a day turn traitor murderer and incestuous wretch the nursling of a chaste heroic mother 
have I not proved unworthy of my birth? Pythias, whose wisdom is by all esteemed, deigned to instruct me when I left her hands. It is no wish of mine to vaunt my merits, but if I may lay claim to any virtue, I think beyond all else I have displayed abhorrence of those sins with which I am charged. For this Hippolytus is known in Greece so continent that he is deemed austere. All know my abstinence is inflexible, the daylight is not purer than my heart. How then could I, burning with fire, profane? Yes, dastard, tis that very pride condemns you. I see the odious reason of your coldness. Phaedra alone bewitched your shameless eyes. Your soul to others' charms indifferent disdained the blameless fires of lawful love. No, father, I have hidden it too long. This heart has not disdained a sacred flame. Here at your feet I own my real offence. I love, and love in truth where you forbid me. Bound to Aresia by my heart's devotion, the child of Pallas has subdued your son. A rebel to your laws, her I adore and breathe forth ardent sighs for her alone. You love her? Heavens! But no, I see the trick. You feign a crime to justify yourself. Sir, I have shunned her for six months and still love her. To you yourself I came to tell it, trembling the while. Can nothing clear your mind of your mistake? What oath can reassure you? By heaven and earth and all the powers of nature! The wicked never shrink from perjury. Cease, cease, and spare me irksome protestations, if your false virtue has no other aid. Though it to you seem false and insincere, Phaedra has a secret cause to know it true. Ah, how your shamelessness excites my wrath! What is the term and place of my banishment? Were you beyond the pillars of Alcides, your perjured presence were too near me yet. What friends will pity me when you forsake and think me guilty of a crime so vile? Go, look you out for friends who hold in honour adultery, and clap their hands at incest. Lo, lawless traitors steeped in infamy, the fit protectors of a knave like you. Are incest and adultery the words you cast at me? I hold my tongue, yet think what Mother Phaedra had. Too well you know her blood, not mine, is tainted with these horrors. What? Does your rage before my eyes lose all restraint? For the last time, out of my sight, hence, traitor, Wait not till a father's wrath force thee away mid general execration. Scene three. Theseus alone. Wretch, thou must meet inevitable ruin. Neptune has sworn by Styx to gods themselves a dreadful oath, and he will execute his promise. Thou canst not escape his vengeance. I loved thee. And in spite of thine offence, my heart is troubled by anticipation for thee. But thou hast earned thy doom too well. Had father ever greater cause for rage? Just gods, who see the grief that overwhelms me, why was I cursed with such a wicked son? Scene 4 Phaedra Theseus my lord, I come to you, filled with just dread. Your voice raised high in anger reached mine ears, and much I fear that deeds have followed threats. Oh, if there yet is time, spare your own offspring. Respect your race and blood, I do beseech you. Let me not hear that blood cry from the ground. Save me the horror and perpetual pain of having caused his father's hand to shed it. No, madam, from that stain my hand is free. But for all that, the wretch has not escaped me. The hand of an immortal now is charged with his destruction. Tis a debt that Neptune owes me, and you shall be avenged. A debt owed you? Prayers made in anger? Never fear that they will fail. Rather join yours to mine. In all their blackness paint for me his crimes, And fan my tardy passion to white heat. But yet you know not all his infamy. 
his rage against you overflows in slanders your mouth he says is full of all deceit he says aresia has his heart and soul that her alone he loves aresia ay he said it to my face an idle pretext a trick that gulls me not let us hope neptune will do him speedy justice to his altars i go to urge performance of his oaths scene five phaedra alone oh he is gone what tidings struck mine ears what fire half smothered in my heart revives what fatal stroke falls like a thunderbolt stung by remorse that would not let me rest i tore myself out of onone's arms and flew to help hippolytus with all my soul and strength who knows if that repentance might not have moved me to accuse myself and if my voice had not been choked with shame perhaps i had confessed the frightful truth oh hippolytus can feel but not for me aresia has his heart his plighted troth ye gods when deaf to all my sighs and tears he armed his eye with scorn his brow with threats i deemed his heart impregnable to love was fortified gainst all my sex alike and yet another has prevailed to tame his pride another has secured his favour perhaps he has a heart easily melted i am the only one he cannot bear and shall i charge myself with his defence scene six phaedra anone know you dear nurse what i have learned just now no but i come in truth with trembling limbs i dreaded with what purpose he went forth the fear of fatal madness made me pale who would have thought it nurse i had a rival a rival yes he loves i cannot doubt it this wild untamable hippolytus who scorned to be admired whom lovers sighs wearied this tiger whom i feared to rouse fawns on a hand that has subdued his pride aresia has found entrance to his heart aresia oh anguish as yet untried for what new tortures am i still reserved all i have undergone transports of passion longings and fears the horrors of remorse the shame of being spurned with contumely were feeble foretastes of my present torments <laughs> they love each other <laughs> by what secret charm have they deceived me where and when and how met they oh, you knew it all why was i cousined you never told me of those stolen hours of amorous converse have they oft been seen talking together did they seek the shades of thickest woods <laughs> alas full freedom had they to see each other heaven approved their sighs they loved without the consciousness of guilt and every morning sun for them shone clear while well, i an outcast from the face of nature shunned the bright day and sought to hide myself death was the only god whose aid i dared to ask i waited for the grave's release watered with tears nourished with gall my woe was all too closely watched i did not dare to weep without restraint in mortal dread tasting this dangerous solace i disguised my terror neath a tranquil countenance and oft had i to check my tears and smile what fruit will they enjoy of their vain love they will not see each other more that love will last for ever even while i speak oh fatal thought they laugh to scorn the madness of my distracted heart in spite of exile that soon must part them with a thousand oaths they seal yet closer union can i suffer a happiness o noni which insults me i crave your pity she must be destroyed my husband's wrath against a hateful stock shall be revived nor must the punishment be light the sister's guilt passes the brothers i will entreat him in my jealous rage what am i saying have i lost my senses 
Is Phaedra jealous? And will she employ Theseus for help? My husband lives, and yet I burn. For whom? Whose heart is this I claim as mine? At every word I say my hair stands up with horror. Guilt henceforth has passed all bounds. Hypocrisy and incest breathe at once through all. My murderous hands are ready to spill the blood of guileless innocence. Do I yet live, wretch that I am, and dare to face this holy son from whom I spring? My father's sire was king of all the gods. My ancestors fill all the universe. Where can I hide? In the dark realms of Pluto? But there my father holds the fatal urn. His hand awards the irrevocable doom. Minos is judge of all the ghosts in hell. Oh, how his awful shade will start and shudder when he shall see his daughter brought before him, forced to confess sins of such varied dye, crimes that may be unknown to hell itself. What wilt thou say, my father, at a sight so dire? I think I see thee drop the urn, and seeking some unheard-of punishment thyself become my executioner. Spare me! A cruel goddess has destroyed thy race, and in my madness recognize her wrath. Alas, my aching heart has reaped no fruit of pleasure from the frightful crime, the shame of which pursues me to the grave, and ends in torment lifelong misery. Ah, madam, pray dismiss a groundless dread. Look less severely on a venial error. You love. We cannot conquer destiny. You are drawn on as by a fatal charm. Is that a marvel without precedent among us? Has love triumphed over you, and o'er none else? Weakness is natural to man. A mortal, to a mortal's lot, submit. You chafe against a yoke that others have long since borne. The dwellers in Olympus, the gods themselves, who terrify with threats the sins of men, have burned with lawless fires. What words are these I hear? What counsel this you dare to give me? Will you to the end pour poison in mine ears? You have destroyed me! You brought me back when I should else have quitted the light of day, made me forget my duty, and see Hippolytus till then avoided. What hast thou done? Why did your wicked mouth with blackest lies slander his blameless life? Perhaps you've slain him, and the impious prayer of an unfeeling father has been answered. No! Not another word! Go! Hateful monster! Away, and leave me to my piteous fate! May heaven with justice pay you your deserts! And may your punishment for ever be a terror to all those who would, like you, nourish with artful wiles the weaknesses of princes, push them to the brink of ruin to which their heart inclines, and smooth the path of guilt! Such flatterers doth the wrath of heaven bestow on kings as its most fatal gift. O oh, gods, to serve her what have I not done? This is the due reward that I have won. End of Act 4「Five of Phaedra」by John Racine Translated by Robert Bruce Boswell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Scene 1 Hippolytus Arikia Can you keep silent in this mortal peril? Your father loves you. Will you leave him thus deceived? If in your cruel heart you scorn my tears, Content to see me never more, Go, part from poor Arisia, But at least, going, Secure the safety of your life, Defend your honour from the shameful stain, And force your father to recall his prayers. There yet is time. Why out of mere caprice Leave the fields free from Phaedra's calumnies? Let Theseus know the truth. Could I say more without exposing him to dire disgrace? How should I venture by revealing all to make a father's brow grow red with shame? The odious mystery to you alone is known. My heart has been outpoured to none save you and heaven. I could not hide from you. Judge if I love you. All I fain would hide, even from myself. But think under what seal I spoke. 
Forget my words, if that may be, and never let so pure a mouth disclose this dreadful secret. Let us trust to heaven my vindication, for the gods are just. For their own honour they will clear the guiltless. Sooner or later, punished for her crime, Phaedra will not escape the shame she merits. I ask no other favour than your silence. In all besides I give my wrath free scope. Make your escape from this captivity. Be bold to bear me company in flight. Linger not here on this accursed soil, where virtue breathes a pestilential air. To cover your departure, take advantage of this confusion caused by my disgrace. The means of flight are ready, be assured. You have as yet no other guards than mine. Powerful defenders will maintain our quarrel. Argos spreads open arms, and Sparta calls us. Let us appeal for justice to our friends, nor suffer Phaedra in a common ruin joining us both to hunt us from the throne, and aggrandize her son by robbing us. Embrace this happy opportunity. What fear restrains? You seem to hesitate. Your interest alone prompts me to urge boldness. When I am all on fire, how comes it that you are ice? Fear you to follow, then, the banished man. Ah, dear to me would be such exile. With what joy my fate to yours, united, could I live by all the world forgotten. But not yet has the sweet tie bound us together. How, then, can I steal away with you? I know the strictest honour forbids me not out of your father's hands to free myself. This is no parent's home, and flight is lawful when one flies from tyrants, but you, sir, love me, and my virtue shirks. No, no, your reputation is to me as dear as to yourself. A nobler purpose brings me to you. Fly from your foes and follow a husband. Heaven, that sends us these misfortunes, sets free from human instruments the pledge between us. Torches do not always light the face of Hymen. At the gates of Trozen, mid ancient tombs where princes of my race lie buried, stands a temple, ne'er approached by perjurers, where mortals dare not make false oaths, for instant punishment befalls the guilty. Falsehood knows no stronger check than what is present there. The fear of death that cannot be avoided. Thither, then, will go, if you consent, and swear to love for ever, and take the guardian god to witness our solemn vows, and his paternal care entreat. I will invoke the name of all the holiest powers, chaste Dian and the queen of heaven. Yea, all the gods who know my heart will guarantee my sacred promises. The king draws near, departs, make no delay. To mask my flight, I linger yet one moment. Go you, and leave with me some trusty guides to lead my timid footsteps to your sides. Scene 2 Theseus, Arikia, Ismene Ye gods, throw light upon my troubled mind. Show me the truth which I am seeking here. Get ready, dear Ismene, for our flights. Scene 3 Theseus, Arikia Your colour comes and goes. You seem confused. Madam, what business had my son with you? Sire, he was bidding me farewell for ever. Your eyes, it seems, can tame that stubborn pride, and the first sighs he breathes are paid to you. I can't deny the truth. He has not, sire, inherited your hatred and injustice. He did not treat me like a criminal. That is to say, he swore eternal love. Do not rely on that inconstant heart. To others has he sworn as much before. He, sire. You ought to check his roving taste. How could you bear a partnership so vile? And how can you endure that vilest slanders should make a life so pure as black as pitch? Have you so little knowledge of his heart? Do you so ill distinguish between guilt and innocence? What mist before your eyes blinds them to virtue so conspicuous? Ah, tis too much to let false tongues defame him. Repent, call back your murderous wishes, sire. Fear, fear lest heaven in its severity hate you enough to hear and grant your prayers. Oft in their wraths the god accept our victims, and often chastise us with their gifts. No, vainly would you cover up his guilt. Your love is blind to his depravity, but I have witness irreproachable. Tears have I seen, true tears that may be trusted. Take heed, my lord. 
Your hands invincible have rid the world of monsters numberless. But all are not destroyed. One you have left alive, your son forbids me to say more. Knowing what respect he still regards you, I should too much distress him if I dared complete my sentence. I will imitate his reverence, and, to keep silent, leave you. Scene 4 This is Alone What is there in her mind? What meaning lurks in speech begun but to be broken short? Would both deceive me with a vain pretense? Have they conspired to put me to the torture? And yet, despite my stern severity, what plaintive voice cries deep within my heart? A secret pity troubles and alarms me. Ononi shall be questioned once again. I must have clearer light upon this crime. Guards, bid Ononi come, and come alone. Scene 5 This is Benok. I know not what the Queen intends to do, but from her agitation dread the worst. Fatal despair is painted on her features. Death's pallor is already in her face. Ononi, shamed and driven from her sight, has cast herself into the ocean depths. None knows what prompted her to deeds so rash. And now the waves hide her from us for ever. What say you? Her sad fate seems to have added fresh trouble to the queen's tempestuous soul. Sometimes, to soothe her secret pain, she clasps her children close and bathes them with her tears. Then suddenly, the mother's love forgotten, she thrusts them from her with a look of horror. She wanders to and fro with doubtful steps. Her vacant eye no longer knows us. Thrice, she wrote, and thrice did she changing her mind destroy the letter ere twas well begun. Vouchsafe to see her, sire, vouchsafe to help her. Heavens! Is Ononi dead, and Phaedra bent on dying too? Oh, call me back, my son! Let him defend himself, and I am ready to hear him. Be not hasty to bestow thy fatal bounty, Neptune. Let my prayers rather remain ever unheard. Too soon I lifted cruel hands, believing lips that may have lied. Ah, what despair may follow! Scene 6 Theseus, Theramenes Theramenes, is it thou? Where is my son? I gave him to thy charge from tenderest childhood. But whence these tears that overflow thine eyes? How is it with my son? Concern too late, affection vain. Hippolytus is dead. Gods! I have seen the flower of all mankind cut off, and I am bold to say that none deserved it less. What? my son dead when i was stretching out my arms to him has heaven hastened his end what was this sudden stroke scarce had we passed out of the gates of troison he silent in his chariot and his guards downcast and silent too around him ranged to the mycenaean road he turned his steeds then lost in thought allowed the reins to lie loose on their backs. His noble chargers, erst so full of ardour to obey his voice, with head depressed and melancholy eye, seemed now to mark his sadness and to share it. A frightful cry that issues from the deep with sudden discord rends the troubled air, and from the bosom of the earth a groan is heard in answer to that voice of terror. Our blood is frozen at our very hearts. With bristling manes, the listening steeds stand still. Meanwhile, upon the watery plain, there rises a mountain billow with a mighty crest of foam that shoreward rolls, and, as it breaks before our eyes, vomits a furious monster. With formidable horns its brow is armed, and all its body clothed with yellow scales. In front a savage bull, behind a dragon, turning and twisting in impatient rage. Its long continued bellowings make the shore tremble, the sky seems horror-struck to see it. The earth with terror quakes, its poisonous breath infects the air. 
the wave that brought it ebbs in fear or fly forgetful of the courage that cannot aid and in a neighbouring temple take refuge all save bold hippolytus a hero's worthy son he stays his steeds seizes his darts and rushing forward hurls a missile with sure aim that wounds the monster deep in the flank with rage and pain it springs e'en to the horse's feet and roaring falls writhes in the dust and shows a fiery throat that covers them with flames and blood and smoke fear lends them wings deaf to his voice for once and heedless of the curb they onward fly their master wastes his strength in efforts vain with foam and blood each courser's bit is red some say a god amid this wild disorder was seen with goads pricking their dusty flanks o'er jagged rocks they rush urged on by terror crash goes the axle tree the intrepid youth sees his car broken up flying to pieces and falls himself entangled in the reins pardon my grief that cruel spectacle will be for me a source of endless tears i saw thy hapless son i saw him sire dragged by the horses that his hands had fed powerless to check their fierce career his voice but adding to their fright his body soon one mass of wounds our cries of anguish fill the plain at last they slacken their swift pace then stop not far from those old tombs that mark where lie the ashes of his royal sires panting i thither run and after me his guard along the track stained with fresh blood that reddens all the rocks caught in the briars locks of his hair hang dripping gory spoils i come i call him stretching forth his hand he opens his dying eyes soon closed again the gods have robbed me of a guiltless life i hear him say take care of sad Arisia when i am dead dear friend if e'er my father mourn undeceived his son's unhappy fate falsely accused to give my spirit peace tell him to treat his captive tenderly and to restore with that the hero's breath fails and a mangled corpse lies in my arms piteous object trophy to the wrath of heaven so changed his father would not know him alas my son dear hope for ever lost the ruthless gods have served me but too well for what a life of anguish and remorse am i reserved Arisia, at that instant flying from you comes timidly to take him for husband there in presence of the gods thus drawing nigh she sees the grass all red and reeking sees sad sight for lover's eye hippolytus stretched there pale and disfigured but for a time doubtful of her misfortune unrecognized the hero she adores she looks and asks where is hippolytus only too sure at last that he lies there before her with sad eyes that silently reproach the gods she shudders groans and falls swooning and all but lifeless at his feet his mani, all in tears kneels down beside her and calls her back to life life that is naught but sense of pain and i to whom this light is darkness now come to discharge the duty the hero has imposed on me to tell thee his last request a melancholy task but hither comes his mortal enemy Scene 7 Theseus, Phaedra, 
Theramenes, Panope, Guards. Madam, you've triumphed, and my son is killed. Ah, but what room have I for fear? How justly suspicion racks me that in blaming him I erred. But he is dead. Accept your victim, rightly or wrongly slain, let your heart leap for joy. My eyes shall be for ever blind. Since you accuse him, I'll believe him guilty. His death affords me cause enough for tears, without a foolish search for further light, which, powerless to restore him to my grief, might only serve to make me more unhappy. Far from this shore and far from you I'll fly, for here the image of my mangled son would haunt my memory and drive me mad. From the whole world I fain would banish me, for all the world seems to rise up in judgment against me, and my very glory waits my punishment, for were my name less known, twere easier to hide me. All the favours the gods have granted me I mourn and hate, nor will I importune them with vain prayers henceforth for ever. Give me what they may, what they have taken will all else outweigh. Theseus, I cannot hear you and keep silence. I must repair the wrong that he has suffered. Your son was innocent. Unhappy father! and it was on your word that i condemned him think you such cruelty can be excused moments to me are precious hear me theseus twas i who cast an eye of lawless passion on chaste and dutiful hippolytus heaven in my bosom kindled baleful fire and vile anone's cunning did the rest she feared hippolytus knowing my madness would make that passion known which he regarded with horror. So advantage of my weakness she took, and hastened to accuse him first. For that she has been punished, though too mildly. Seeking to shun my wrath she cast herself beneath the waves. The sword ere now had cut my thread of life, but slandered innocence made its cry heard, and I resolved to die in a more lingering way, confessing first my penitence to you. A poison brought to Athens by Medea runs through my veins. Already in my heart the venom works, infusing there a strange and fatal chill. Already as through thickening mists I see the spouse to whom my presence is an outrage, death, from mine eyes veiling the light of heaven, restores its purity that they defiled. She dies, my lord. Would that the memory of her disgraceful deed could perish with her. Ah, disabused too late. Come, let us go, and with the blood of mine unhappy son mingle our tears, clasping his dear remains in deep repentance for a prayer detested let him be honoured as he well deserves and to appease his sore offended ghost be her near kinsman's guilt whate'er it may aresia shall be held my daughter from to-day end of act five end of phaedra by Jorasin. Translated by Robert Bruce Boswell.